Hey there, internets. I'm Michael, and this is Two Can Play That Game, bringing you the continuation of how to play Super Dungeon Explore Forgotten King. Now, if you are interested in this game at all, and it's still March 2016, please do make sure to check out the Two Can Win That Game competition, where you could win as a second prize this opened copy of Super Dungeon Explore Forgotten King. And as the first prize, this unopened copy. That's right, two copies of the game up for grabs for absolutely nothing. So please do check that out. There is a link in the description on this video. So without the way, let's take it straight to the table to carry on learning how to play Super Dungeon Explore Forgotten King. Here we have a zoomed in look at a single tile. So we have the Bramble spawn point out here, the Bramble Knight one, and I've placed all the miniatures that go with that about. Got the treasure chest here, and then we have the heroes over here around the start marker. It doesn't matter if you're playing classic or arcade, the heroes will go first. However, there is a difference to the hero's turn, depending on whether you're playing classic or arcade. If you are playing classic, on the hero's turn, you may only activate one hero. So in the situation here, we actually have three heroes in the game. But if we were playing classic, we would pick one hero to activate and they would take their turn. Once they've taken their turn, it would then be the console's turn and then another hero would get to activate. Now, Say we did activate this Thunder Veil the Huntress. She then wouldn't be able to have another go to be activated again until both Princess Emerald and the Questing Knight had had actions in between each of these characters taking their go. The console will get a turn. Where this is different with Arcade is you choose two heroes in arcade mode to activate before you activate the console. However, again, you still need to activate all heroes before you're able to activate a hero again. So we could, for example, activate Princess Emerald and the Questing Knight on this first turn. The console would then have a turn and then it would be the hero's turn again and we would not be able to activate either the Questing Knight or Princess Emerald until we had activated the Thunder Veil Huntress. However, as one of our two, we would activate the Thunder Veil Huntress. And then for the second hero, we'd be able to pick either Princess Emerald or the Questing Knight to activate. Having chosen which hero you're going to activate, you'll then perform that hero's activation. Now, the way this will work is you'll first perform upkeep on the hero. So any temporary effects that you had from the previous activation will be removed so that they no longer are happening. If you have any princess coins, in this upkeep stage would be the time to use these and I'll talk later on about how you actually get these. Next, if you have any effects that trigger during the upkeep phase, such as the tough ability that heals you, this would then apply. Also, any negative effects you would apply at this stage, such as fire or poison or any other ones. So the next thing to talk about with regards to a hero being activated is, of course, what that hero can do. Now, I spoke earlier about the layout of these cards. So during a hero's activation, they may move that many squares as denoted by their card. Now, they can split up that movement amongst the actions that they choose to perform. So Princess Emerald here could choose to move two spaces, then use one action point, move two spaces, use another action point, for example. So that's movement. And the way this would work for large creatures like the Huntress here is that that would be one space of movement or that would be one space of movement. So you choose a square and do one space of movement from there. And diagonals are a single space of movement. Now, obviously, you need to be aware of any 
terrain effects that would block your movement and of course walls as well. Also you can move through friendly figures so this knight here can move through the huntress by going one two three to there for example but could not choose to end their movement on the huntress. So if they were moving and they would not have enough movement to get past they cannot make that movement. Now you can move through friendly heroes but you can't move through enemy models so obviously monsters can't move through heroes and heroes can't move through monsters. Then the next thing to talk about is of course the action points because that's the other thing you can do other than moving is spend your action points. Now each card has their unique actions that you can spend them on be them attack or support but there is also a big list of basic actions you can perform. And these are listed out in both rule books, but I'll give you a quick summary of them now. So basic actions, you have your offensive actions. So if you have a little wand symbol next to your wheel, you can do a magic attack. If you've got a sword next to your strength, you can do a strength melee attack. And if you've got a little arrow next to your dex, you can do a ranged missile attack. So the only offensive action is a basic attack, which means that if you win, you just do one damage to the creature and that is it. Other actions you can do are support actions. So you can bandage at a range of one and that will cost you one action point. And this allows you to heal wounds on your target. But first you need to roll your will dice and if you get more stars than number of wounds you get to remove a wound. Another action you can do is conjure a pet. So if you have picked up a wonder that would give you a pet you can then conjure it. If you have any traps on the board you'll be able to disarm traps and you'll roll decks and the trap will tell you what the difficulty is on this. Also you can pick the lock on a chest so if we were next to this chest we could try and pick the lock on it which would mean rolling our dex attribute and if we get three or more stars then we draw two treasure cards from the treasure deck and discard the treasure chest. Now an alternative to picking the lock on a treasure chest would be to open a treasure chest so if we had the key we could simply open the treasure chest as an action discarding a key token and then we would get the two treasures. Alternatively you can try and smash open a chest. You can obviously only do this next to the chest and there's no checks required when doing it. You simply say you've smashed the chest but you only get one treasure card rather than two. Another action you can do is if you have any status effects on you you can use vigor and the way this works is you roll your armor dice and if you get more stars than you have status effects you can remove one status effect and that costs an action. The final support action you can do that isn't unique is to run and what this means is you have to use all of your action points so you've got three action points you'd have to use all three to do it but it does allow you to move double your movement so in this case Princess Emerald would get to move 12 spaces rather than six. As well as moving or attacking you can spend potion tokens in order to use potion abilities. Now you are limited to only using one potion in each turn but you'd be able to then use any potion ability that you have on your hero card. So let's talk a bit more about the offensive actions because that is going to be a big part of this game. Obviously you are trying to kill the monsters and to kill the spawn points and kill the dungeon boss. So let's talk a bit on how that will actually work. So first thing I want to do is we're going to ignore any abilities because they are different for every hero. We'll just do basic attacks. So if we look at Princess Emerald here and let's do her ranged 8 attack which gives her 
two blue dice and one red dice for her decks. So she is over here at the moment and she wants to shoot this bunny-eared guy over here that's an executioner. Now to do that we first determine do, does the character have line of sight and enough range? So the range is eight so we'd go one, two, three, four, five, six. So there is line of sight to that character and it's within range. Now see Princess Emerald would not be able to shoot this Billman over here because one, two, three, four, there is a wall in the way. You can't count around the wall. You can't shoot round it. And of course, if you were doing melee, you probably only got a range of one or two. So you'd need to be much closer to perform a melee attack. But as I say, Princess Emerald here is going to shoot the Executioner. So we get her dice for her decks, which is two blue and a red, and we roll them. The number of stars that she gets is how many successes she has. Now, in arcade mode, you would look at the monster. So we have the Executioner here, and they have a fixed armor value, and their armor value is two stars. So in order to hit the Executioner, you would need more than two stars. So with these two blanks and two stars, Princess Emerald would fail, and that would be the end of that action. She spent that action point, but she has three, so she's gonna try again with her second action point and fail again. Let's try the third one. Well, <laughs> let, let's say the third one actually hit. She rolled three stars rather than failing. So that means she has beaten the armor on this executioner and we would deal it a wound. However, because this executioner has a minion within two spaces, the wound and any effects that that attack cause instead happen to the minion. So in this case, we deal one wound to a minion, and you can see on the card here that these Billman minions only have one health, so it'd be removed. Say there weren't any Billman, or that we were playing classic mode, you would simply place a wound token by the miniature on the board to keep track. Also, in the classic mode, the stat cards are different. So you can see here the executioner would actually have an armor value that is dice. So to defend, they would roll a blue dice and a red dice. And they got two stars. So Princess Emerald would still hit even in this situation. Now you can see here that it has free health. So we'd simply put a health token down to mark that it had taken a hit. So let's talk about the other things that can come up on these dice. Well, the blue dice are your weakest dice and have the less ch least chances of getting successes. But what they do give you is they have a one side in six that has a heart symbol on. Now, if when attacking, you roll this heart symbol, you may immediately remove one status effect or one wound from any hero. It does not need to be the active hero. And the whole idea is this little heart in proper arcade fashion has popped out, and it's bouncing around and someone's picked it up. The red dice are your next best dice with regards to number of successes, but they do still have a blank. But rather than a heart, these have a potion symbol. And what that means is that when you roll this, and only on attack, not on defense, only when attacking, a potion pops out of the monster rather than a heart. So you would take a potion token and give it to any hero. It does not need to be the active hero. However, they do have to have space for a potion, and keep in mind the potion limit is given on each character's card. For the majority, it is one potion. There is one other type of dice that you may get later on in the game, and that is the green dice. Now this has the most chance of successes, and rather than having a potion or a heart, it gives you both a potion and a heart. So when this comes up, you'll get to heal a wound or remove a status effect 
and gain a potion. That was obviously a ranged attack. If you were doing a melee attack, it would work exactly the same way, except for you would be using your strength and comparing that to the monster's armor value. Some of your support actions will also require you to roll dice, such as Princess Emerald here, who has the scope ability, which has a range of eight, and is a dex fees dex roll. So you would roll Princess Emerald's dex, and in classic mode, you would compare it to the monster's dex value. Now, in arcade mode, the monsters don't have a stat block. Instead, anything that is a V's is compared against their armor value. So, in this case, if Princess Emerald was using scope, it would be the result of her dex dice against the monster's armor value. In arcade mode, a lot of the actions you'll choose to do with a hero will cause you to gain Wrath. Now, obviously, in that original table where you were choosing the size of game, there was a certain number of Wrath tokens to be distributed. So for a free player game here, there'll be five of these being used. Now, these are not used for Classic. They are only used for this arcade mode. And when you perform one of the actions listed out on this card here, you will then gain that many wrath tokens. So if you destroy an elite or minion monster, you gain one wrath. So you'd simply put one of these tokens on that character. If you run out of wrath tokens to give a character, you'd pick one of the other heroes and take a token off of them to put on this hero that's performing the action. So you can see here, you'll also gain wrath for using heal ability, for using support actions, for using potions, opening treasure chests, and destroying a mini boss or spawn point. These wrath tokens are important in the arcade mode as they'll dictate how the monsters behave. They'll either go after the person with the most or least wrath, for example. Now, if you ever have a draw on that wrath, the monster will target whoever was the last to activate, so it was most recently activated. So that is everything involved in activating a hero. And that would then be the end of the hero's activation once they'd done any potions they wanted to, used all their action points and used up their movement that they wanted to use. At which point you perform the power-up stage. And you'll do this power-up stage after every hero's turn, which in arcade would be two heroes activating, then a power-up. However, in the classic mode, one hero will activate and then you'll do a power up. And you also do the power up stage after the console activates. So the first thing is sorting out equipment. So we have here our treasure deck. And our blue loot deck. So first thing you do is the party will draw one card for the loot deck for every elite or minion monster they destroyed during this turn. However, it is a maximum of three. So if you destroyed one minion, for example, you get one card, two minions, two cards. So it's important to keep track of what you are killing. Now, if you killed a mini boss or a boo booty, you will as well draw a treasure card. Now, it's important to note if a monster was destroyed during the console turn, you would not get one of these treasure cards. Also, a hero may only ever have one of these red treasure cards equipped at a time. They cannot have more than that. Also, any equipment that you do not equip during this power-up phase gets discarded. If it's a treasure card that you're discarding, even if it were, had previously been equipped and you'd chosen to replace it with a different treasure card, a hero may remove a single wound or status token of your choice. You're not able to unequip equipment and pass it to a different hero. If you want to replace a piece of equipment with another one, you have to discard the old one. You can't give it away. And of course, if you, in the unlikely event, run out of loot or treasure cards, 
you'll just shuffle up your discards to give you more to draw from. Next step of the power up phase is wonders. So if you have any wonders, you may equip any you have acquired. And each of these will have unique rules for how they work. Next is the mighty monster stage. So this is when you've destroyed a mini boss. You will then gain, each of the monsters will gain this benefit. So in arcade mode, each monster would have plus one arm. And in classic mode, that each monster would gain plus one success, plus one star to all defense rolls. So it doesn't matter what they're rolling, if it's armor, decks, etc., they get plus one. And those, of course, are cumulative as you destroy more mini bosses. The monsters will gain more benefits and get harder. And then the final part of the power up phase is boss spawn. So Whenever you destroy one of these spawn points, at the end of the turn where that happens, and it doesn't matter if it's the console turn or a hero turn, as long as it's not the last spawning point, then you'll place a mini boss. And this mini boss will be placed so that it shares at least one square with where the spawn point was. Now, if you don't have any mini bosses left in your spawning pool, you just increase as if the mini boss had been destroyed on your mighty monsters table. If it is your last spawn point and it gets destroyed, then you bring out your big bad main boss. And again, he'll be placed so that he shares one space with where that spawning point had been. And that is your power up phase. With that over, you would then move on to the console turn. So let's talk about how the console turn will work. First, we'll talk about classic mode as that is the simplest. And in classic mode, the console has two choices. He can either choose to spawn, which means he'll choose one of the spawn points in the game. And that spawn point will spawn all of its monsters the same as it did during setup. At this time, it would then take a point of damage. So you'd just give it a little heart token to indicate it's taken one point of damage. And the amount of damage they can take is of course given on their stat card with the heart symbol. The other option you have is to activate monsters. And the, what monsters can do when activated is exactly the same as what heroes can do. And in the classic mode, you can see the layout of the cards is exactly the same as it is for a hero, except for one small difference. Except for having a potion bottle here and a number, they've got a skull symbol and a number. The reason for this is that when the console chooses to activate monsters, they may activate four skulls worth of monsters and one boss. Now, bosses do actually have a skull value as well. So if you have multiple bosses out at a time, you could choose to activate one boss as your boss activation and one boss using its skulls value. So you can see here that Billman, for example, only have a one skull value. So you'd be able to activate four of those. And as I say, what you can do in a turn would be exactly the same as the heroes. So you would move and then use your action points to attack and you've got your stats here. Now, one thing to note is that with monsters, some of them will just have a star with a number on rather than a cube. And this represents that they just have one automatic success. They don't roll any dice. So once the console had either done his spawn and taken a point of damage or activated monsters, it would then be the end of the console turn, so you'd do the power-up phase as you do at the end of every turn. That's the classic mode. Now, let's talk about arcade mode. And there is something more in-depth to go into here, and that is monster gangs. So, the majority of bosses will be unique and individual. However, the majority of other cards are gangs. So you can see here we have the Executioner's Arcade Gang 
And on that, you have the stats for Billman and also for Grobit Executioners. Now, these stat cards are very differently laid out. Along the top right here, you have the number of action points, but you have two columns. This first column represents if that monster is on its own and only the elite, so the top monster, so in this case, the executioner, gets these stats. Minions, which are the bottom ones, will never have these. So if it's on its own, this executioner would get one action with strength of three stars and a range of two spaces. However, if it has one of these minions listed on its card, so the billman, within two spaces of it, it is treated as having the red stat block. So it increases its range and also increases its strength on its attacks. Then below this, you'll have first your elite, which is the main part of the gang and the only part that will actually attack the heroes. And next to that, you'll have their movement, their health and their armor value. And then of course, underneath the minions also have their movement, health and armor value. The box underneath the name is then telling you what special abilities they have. So the executioner has massive damage and as a support action, death sentence, which give them plus one movement. Now, when a billman is within two spaces of an executioner, that executioner will also gain the abilities listed in this box here. So in this case, they would gain the slow ability. So when they hit with an attack, it would slow the hero. And again, on the back here, you have description of all the special abilities listed on the card. So that would be one gang there. Let's take a look at another example of a type of gang. And this time we are looking at the House of Frog elite gang. Now, the reason I wanted to show you this one is that the bonded minion is actually the same type of character as the elite. The way this works is that you have two models and both count as being elites, but they also count as being minions for if they're within two spaces of each other, they'll both count as having the red column for being in a gang and they'll both gain the knockdown and surefoot abilities. Now, there is one other thing I want to talk about with regards to gangs, and that is that minions are expendable. And you saw an example of this when I was doing the attacks for the heroes. And it only happens in arcade mode that when you attack the elite of a gang, if there is a minion of that gang within two spaces, it will take all the wounds and negatives of that attack. But you still are trying to beat the elite's armor value. Of course, you could target the minion directly and then you only have to defeat their armor value. So next, let's talk about how the console turn actually works in arcade mode. So obviously there's no one to choose whether to spawn or to activate monsters and which monsters to activate. But what you do do is you determine what monsters are disturbed. And what that means is any monster on the same tile as a hero is disturbed. Any monster on a tile that a hero attacked, so if one of these monsters had been attacked, would be disturbed. Any monsters that are on a tile connected by an open doorway to a tile with heroes on are disturbed. So typically what you will have is a situation where two tiles are disturbed at once, potentially three, depending on the layout of the board. So here we have heroes in this first tile. That would mean all monsters on this tile are disturbed and all monsters on the adjacent tile. If there was also a tile connected at the top here by an open doorway or on this side, that would also be disturbed. Once you've determined 
which monsters are disturbed, you then need to determine what order they will activate the abilities given on the command card. Now, the easy way to do this is you start with the most powerful monster. So if you've got a boss out, that will activate first. If you've got multiple bosses, whoever is closest to the hero with the most wrath would activate first. So in the situation we have here, Princess Emerald here has two wrath tokens on, so she has the most. If there was a draw, then it would be whoever activated most recently. So once you've done your bosses, you would then look at your elites. So which elites, and that would be in the situation we're looking at here, all four of the ones on this tile are elites, these frog knights are elites, and this executioner is an elite. However, these billmen are minions. So we would do all of our elites before we do our minions, and it would be whoever is closest to Princess Emerald of those elites that will activate first. Once you've done your elites, then you do your minions. So the next step would be to perform upkeep, the same as you do on a hero's turn. So any healing or effects that you need to resolve, you would do so at this point. Then you need to get your command deck, which is your little cards with the arcade machine on that are purple. And you will simply turn over a card and that will tell you what you're doing this turn. So for example, the card I've turned over here says combo, move one, unique one, fight one. And there are lots of different cards that have different layouts of what they'll do. For instance, we have here rush that is move two, fight one, hack and slash, move one, fight one. We've got turbo, move two, horde, Spawn command affects all spawning points for this turn, and then you perform a spawn. Remedy, mend, and these tell you what they do. So remedy, you remove all status effects. Mend, remove one wound token. And I'm gonna tell you a bit now about what the various commands you'll see on these cards actually mean. So let's start with spawn. So the same as in the classic mode, you will pick one of the disturbed spawn points, so that'd be on the same tile as the heroes or adjacent tile, and you would spawn any available monsters for that spawn point from the spawning pool. So let's say we had a spawn on this Bramble Knight spawning point here. We, don't, we only have two Billmen available in the spawning point, so we'd spawn those using the same rules as when we were setting up the game. So they'd appear there and there. And of course, for spawning, the spawning point would suffer a wound. Now, let's imagine a situation where those Billmen were already out. And in fact, all the miniatures are already out, but we drew, drew the spawn card. Now, there are no spawning points that can be activated because all the miniatures are out. There's nothing left in the spawning pool. Uh, what this means is you then just draw another command card that will actually result in something happening. So next, let's talk about move. So obviously the movement is given on the cards, on the joystick pad, same as it is for everything else. And if it says move one, you will move each of those characters towards the hero with the most wrath as efficiently as possible in the order you determined before. Now, you'll move up to their movement and you will stop once you are within solo range. So for the, this is for the elites and solo monsters, sorry. You'll do this, you'll move until you're within solo range, which is of course your yellow range. So let's just quickly look at an example of these frog knights here. So they can move eight. Now the closest one is this one here. So he's gonna go one, two, three, four, five, six. And he has a range of two. So he's gonna go seven to there, which puts him within two squares. Then this one activates and he goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight and he's also within two squares. 
So you can see this one stopped at seven movement because it reached within two squares. So they will not necessarily use all of their movement. Also, even if there is another hero closer to them, if it's not the one with the most wrath, they will move away from that other hero. Once you have activated and done the move on your solos and your elites, you'll then do your minions. Now, the way minions work is they don't move towards the player with the most wrath. What they do is move towards the closest monster that is in the their gang. So for these billmen, they will move towards the closest executioner. And they will stop once they get within two squares so that they're giving the boost to that executioner. So you can see these billmen just move up to surround and boost this executioner. If you did move two, you would do the full movement activation as we've just done. And then you would do it again if there were any elites not within two spaces of the hero with the most wrath, or any minions not within two spaces of an elite from their gang. The next action that might come up on the command cards is unique. And what this means is you perform the unique action listed on your card. So for example, this Willow of the Wisp would pre perform the Pollen Dream act action that gives them the slow ability. Now, some unique actions will be offensive and some will be support actions, the same as they are for the heroes. Also, with unique abilities, if an elite has a minion, bonded minion within two spaces, it will gain the ability listed for that as well. However, if we look here, you can see the abilities have the same name, but this bottom one has kind of an explosion-y effect around it. What this means is that ability actually replaces the previous one. So rather than doing the basic Pollen Dream, if there is another Wisp within two spaces, they perform the enhanced one. Other symbols you might see that you've not seen before are these buttons with skulls on. These represent signature actions, and you do still perform these when performing a unique action. However, these also will be performed during a fight command if there was not a unique command issued. So let's talk about a fight command. Now, it's important to note minions, so for example, our billmen here, do not take part in a fight command. All they are doing is boosting the elites. So you would look at your bosses and perform your attacks with your bosses and then you would perform the attacks for the elites. So let's look at our frog knights here, for example. So each attack would cost one action point. And you can see here frog knights, no matter if they're in a gang or not, only have one action point. So they would each perform one attack. They can do so at a range of two and their number of successes is fixed at two or three if they're in a gang. The hero they're attacking would then roll their dice for their armor. So we have here Princess Emerald rolled two. So if the house frog had been on its own, two would be enough to defend. However, because it's in a gang, it isn't. And that would mean that Princess Emerald would take a wound and suffer any other status effects that that creature is causing. Now, because there are two of these, they would both get to attack using this red figure and they would gain the benefits of Knockdown and Surefoot because they are within reach of a bonded creature. And that is then everything the console can potentially end up doing on their turn. So there are just a couple more rules for me to go over. The first applies only to Classic Mode, and it is called Boss Fight. So it's when you're big bad boss comes out. So for instance, here we have our Forgotten King. And when you spawn this, you will need to get your boss fight card, which is this little one with the greenish border and has the character name on. And then under the name, it will say boss spawn. So this is an effect that happens when the boss spawns. In this case, King's Riches 
Whenever the Forgotten King suffers a wound, the party may draw one loot card. The next thing we have here is the timeout. And this will occur as soon as the boss has received half of their hit points in damage or more. And that point, this ability will activate. So we have here Last Stand, Forgotten King, Elite and Minion Monsters gain immunity. So the next thing I want to talk about is these little princess tokens here and how you'll get these. So when you destroy a spawning point, as well as that resulting during the power up phase in a boss being summoned, it also results in a princess coin being dropped in that space. Then when a hero is next to it, they can pick it up as a free action as part of their activation. And that will then sit in a communal spot known as the backpack that anyone can access during anyone's activation. What you can use these princess coins for is during your upkeep phase, you can discard a princess coin from the backpack in order to fully heal and remove all status effects from one character or to resurrect a dead hero. So let's talk about when a hero dies. So let's say these frog knights here pounced on Princess Emerald and did her five damage, which is all her health. That would kill her. So we remove the model from the board and we place one of these death tokens in the space that she was occupying. What this represents is all the equipment that she had equipped is still sat there. Any other hero, once next to it, as a free action, can loot her body and take the equipment off of it. But then if she gets resurrected through the use of a princess token, she would no longer have any equipment and you would not be able to pass it back to her. When a princess token is used to resurrect a dead hero, so let's say Princess Esmeralda was resurrected, they are placed either on or adjacent to the start marker. If the equipment was never collected, you would remove the death token from the board and when that player resurrects, they still have all of that equipment. It teleports to them. I mentioned earlier about treasure chest keys, but I haven't told you how you get these. Well, whenever you kill a mini boss, such as the Trent here, if he was out on the board and you managed to kill him, as well as getting treasure for doing that, he will also drop a key in one of the spaces he was occupying. Then, as a free action during an activation, a hero can pick up that key, and as with the princess tokens, it will go into your communal backpack that anyone can use. Another rule to cover is when you move onto a new tile for the first time, you will turn over one of these exploration cards. Now some are traps such as this. Now it tells you here the difficulty of the trap and the type of trap and how you set these out will vary depending on the type of the trap and you can check the advanced rules for how to do that. There, here it tells you what that trap will actually do. Some will be creep factories. And whenever a creep factory happens, you will spawn six creeps into the tile. And there are lots of different effects you could have, such as here we have the gypsy princess. Human, Frasian and demon heroes add plus one star to all offense rolls. So some of these will be good for the heroes, some will be bad, and they'll only apply to the tile that it was drawn for. So I'd suggest you place it on that tile so that you remember that that is an effect for that tile. So the final thing to talk about once again is when the game ends. So obviously you will proceed taking turns alternating between the hero, the console, and doing power-ups after each turn until you have fought and killed the boss or all the heroes are dead. And that would be the end of the game. And that is how you play Super Dungeon Explore Forgotten King. Of course, if you are interested in the game and it's still March 2016, please do enter our giveaway competition to win a copy of this game for absolutely nothing. And of course, 
If you have enjoyed this video, please do check out the rest of the videos in this series. There will also be a playthrough and review of the game. And of course, check out the rest of the videos on the channel while you're at it. And of course, subscribe to the channel and share it with your friends and family. You can also check us out on social media. You can find us on Facebook or Twitter. And as always, thanks for watching and bye for now.